or of other issues and right. it turned into you know violent acts towards uh, Christians or non-Muslims. Mm -hmm. So um, what how do you relate to that in terms of in terms of what the non-Muslim communities uh, sensitivities to Islam should be and what non-religious communities or people's sensitivities toward, towards other religions should be. Well, I, when I go to church, I'm an atheist. I was raised atheist, never believed in anything. But when I go to the Russian Orthodox Church, because that's my uh, ethnic heritage, mm -hmm. I cover my head out of uh, respect. Mm -hmm. I don't necessarily pray, but I don't <coughs> want people to feel uncomfortable around me. Right. But if I don't know Muslim um, traditions and I can't, I can't easily offend them. So what do you think we should do not to offend, but at the same time, don't feel like we, you know, can't relate to them at all? Well, I guess to start with the whole Muhammad thing, um, that's the hot button topic, of course. Um, back when the Muhammad cartoons came out, I was still. Well, uh, I, I had read Karen Armstrong. That was the only reason I was so religious. Um, Karen Armstrong writes about the separation between your mythological spiritual life and your real life. And I thought, okay, I can do both. Uh, didn't last too long, but I was still there. I was still very much a Muslim. And when the cartoon controversy happened, my stance was, yeah, they're offensive, but yeah, they also are allowed to speak, just like we're allowed to speak. And we can counter their speech with our speech. Which is why I did attend a protest of the cartoons, but I was not in favor of censoring them. I said, you know, all right, they drew something stupid. What really got to me was, I even wrote a poem about it because I used to do that when I was sort of more in head in the clouds. Uh, I wrote a poem about how Muslims took the bait. The whole point of those cartoons was to incite to offend, and what happened? People died and there were riots. And that really upset me as a Muslim because I thought, what are, we, what are we proving to these people? That we're better than they are or that we're worse than they are? Um, so even as a Muslim, I had a problem with that. Because um, I'm a big believer in, you know, all right, freedom of speech means you can say stuff and I can say stuff. And then you can say stuff back and I can say, we can go back and forth all day. But you have the right to say it, of course, within safe means. Um, although I don't know if it's safe to really insult moments. Um, so, as a Muslim, I had that view. I continue to have that view. Um, I guess it depends on what your end goal is. If you want to engage with Muslims, if you want to make Islam a little bit more moderate or something along those lines, or at least open up the dialogue, then you probably don't want to try to go out and offend them. But there are some people who don't care. You know, there's some people who just, they want to offend, they want to incite. What can you do with those people? I don't really know. You know, they want to do what they want to do. Um, but it is really, it really galls me, especially as someone who, yeah, I don't believe in Islam, but I have a Muslim family. When I see these things happen, you know, my mother, whenever she turns on the news and hears about a violent action, her first, I, she sometimes even says it, and I know her first thought is, please don't let it be Muslim. Please don't let it be Muslim. It's just going to make my life more miserable. And one thing that I, I've come to understand about the Muslim world is that a lot of their governments are so controlling that they don't understand that in the United States or in Europe even, just because someone said something doesn't mean the government agrees with it. Just because someone made a statement doesn't mean the government even had anything to do with it or approved of it. We can say all kinds of stuff in the United States and not get into trouble. But in other countries, they don't have that luxury. They just don't. They don't have that. So to conceptualize the idea that, you know, someone can make a really terrible, poorly shot movie um, where people were in brown face, which was so horrible. That, that was the part that got to me the most about that whole trailer for that movie, The Innocence of Muslims or whatever it was. The brown face. Did the, the actors not realize that you're not supposed to do that, maybe? <laughs> that you're kind of putting on a ministerial act in a lot of ways? But, um, <laughs> Uh, they, uh, I read statements from Muslim countries by angry Muslims who said things like, how can their government let them do that? And so I guess helping them to understand that our government doesn't let us do that. Well, they do, but there's no approval process. It's not like that director you know, wrote President Obama and said, I want to make an offensive movie about Muslims. Can I do it, please? 
So there's that. Um, I don't like the idea though that, I mean, there are some places in the world and even in the United States where Muslims have tried to sort of change the way people do things so that they don't get offended. Like there are Muslims who say things like, oh, they shouldn't serve pork in the cafeteria out of sensitivity to us. Or you can't have an uncovered woman in front of us because that's offensive. So that's where their rights start trampling on our rights. Not to make an us of them here, I mean, but <laughs> I kind of just did. What can you do? But um, yeah, that's where their rights start intruding on ours, and that's not fair. But you know, going out of your way to be offensive, if that's what you want to do, I guess you can. But if your end goal is more understanding, a better world is probably not the best way to go about it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's complex. It depends on where you're talking about too. I'm just thinking there are so many restrictions that people who are not privy to that don't know. And they right. go, you know, go along offending, like you said, there is pork and cafeteria. Well, you know, we're not covering. Well, you can see midriff of women walking around, you know. There are all other things that maybe we're not supposed to do. How far should we go to learn about it? Um, it depends on what you care about. If you want to engage with Muslims, then you should probably learn. If not, I mean, just, I mean, living your life should not be particularly offensive to anybody. Um, when I was a Muslim, if a man stuck out his hand to shake, I would just go like this and say, sorry, you know, or say something. If at the time I explained to him that I'm not supposed to at all touch men who are not related to me. But um, my view was always, you know, educate them. And some Muslims may feel that people should educate themselves, but I mean, you can't learn everything about every religion in the whole world and every single cultural taboo. It's tough. And most, I would say most people in minorities understand that they have to educate the majority. Um, whether we like it or not, you <laughs> kind of have to. Um, yeah, I guess, I guess too, if you live in a community that has a lot of Muslims, maybe it would behoove you to learn more about it um, if you want to engage with them. But most Muslims are generally pretty happy to answer questions. I was. I prefer that to someone yelling at me right? if they asked me about it. It was, it was a much more pleasant experience for everybody. Yes? So, growing up Christian in Southern California, I found that there was a lot of sort of passive complicity with the more radical elements of that thing. Right. Um, I have friends who believe that Katrina was God's judgment on New Orleans. What's your read on that in the Muslim community? It's pretty similar. <laughs> I mean, there, there, there is, I mean, the, probably the only thing that in my book that's even a little bit confrontational is, you know, what they wouldn't tell you. Because there is a difference between what they're going to tell white people who visit their mosque and what goes on the mosque when there are no outsiders there. Um, it's going to be a little bit different. And I'm not trying to say there's evil terrorist spots everywhere, because there aren't. There really aren't. But yeah, you know, they'll, they'll look at uh, they'll look at natural disasters. Oh, oh, the big one in Southern California that my parents always like to cite is uh, the fires that happened in Laguna. And that area, that was back in, I think, the 80s. A long time ago, but um, that, huh? They almost burned down the house. Wow. Okay. <laughs> but my parents have pointed out and say that's what they get for being such a gay area. <clears throat> They're like all the gays are there. Allah put his cleansing fire there. <sighs> not so nice, right? Um, and so they'll, they'll they'll say things like that. It's not necessarily going to lead to much action, but it's definitely distasteful and uncomfortable. And to think that I occasionally have thoughts like that. Um, it's, it's uncomfortable, but that, that does happen. You know, there are people, Muslims will say, yeah, I've never actually condoned terrorism, but Muslims have, a, some of the terrorists have a point when it comes to things like Israel, or the military bases that used to be in Saudi Arabia, or um, the bombings in Iraq and, and Afghanistan and everywhere else, pretty much or the American unwavering support for Israel. They'll, they'll cite these things and say, these are real problems. Terrorism isn't really that great of a solution, but it's drawing attention to these problems. So they might go about it that way. Yes? More, more of a comment than a question. But sure. I feel like if you have a religion that states that there is an almighty power which has a set plan for um, the, uh, you know, just the, just the general uh, occurrence of events, you're going to have people that point to disasters and say, see, that's the will of 
the creator of God. So I, I feel like that spans to all religions. Yeah, I, I mean, I've heard, I've heard things all the time about that. And like, you have, you have Christians who support the IRA and terrorist organizations, and you have Jews who support the more radical elements of, of you know, Israel that do things in that nature. So I feel like that's, I don't know, I, I feel like it's kind of universal. It is, it, it, I would even venture to say, and I can't really think of any examples right now, which kind of goes against my point, but it, it, it happens even with secular matters. Um, you know, you've got people who would never go and bomb a building, but they are supportive of people who do. In the case of animal rights, for example, um, you have PETA paying for the defense of people who bomb buildings. Not everyone who supports PETA might directly agree with that, but they're putting their money there. So, you know, it happens with a lot of groups. Anytime you have, I guess, highly cherished ideals, especially ones that go against the majority, you're going to have radicals and you're going to have people that, I guess, kind of support them in a way. It's, it's tough. Um, any other questions? Yeah. So I, I um, felt could feel some resonance in some of the things that you talked about in terms of um, conservative Christian communities. Mm -hmm. And I think about, you know, uh, fairly militant Buddhists, uh, Hindus. You, know, you just go on through the list. Right. You can read, uh, I guess, maybe fundamentalism. And you talk about, uh, you know, animal rights and environmental organizations that also seem to have, you might think of them as, as, in, in some ways as fundamentalists, or at least willing to engage in violence because they're certain that their perspective is correct. Right. And it seems like, you know, the sort of the, the at least part of the enlightenment journey has been this notion that maybe truth isn't quite so certain that perhaps there are different viewpoints that are acceptable that right. you know that that you that you have to engage in dialogue and agree, perhaps even to disagree or to compromise. And it seems like so it's not I don't think it's I, I'm I'm I don't, know, I don't know that it's necessarily, well, it's not even, as you point out, a religious, a religious a conflict. It seems more like a, almost a mindset of uh, certainty and the willingness to act on that certainty as opposed to, uh, I guess, the more liberal notion of doubt and, and, uh, and, and compromise. And I'm wondering if you, uh, you know, from your perspective, if you, uh, how do we, is it reasonable to assume that the whole world should be overtaken by, you know, sort of Western liberal enlightenment, or? Uh, where where uh, liberalization or more progressive views seem to take root and have the most success seem to be where they arise from within that community. So you have places where things are a little better, or people have changed in their views or softened in their views. That usually comes from within. Going in and trying to tell them what to do is just going to lead to more backlash. That doesn't work. Just even if you think that's the right thing to do, it's ineffective. Um, and the question of certainty versus doubt and all that, it's, it's a tough one too. I try to walk the line as much as I can, but there are definitely things I'm fairly certain of, and I do act based on that certainty. It's not that I completely doubt everything ever. Um, I'm not really a big fan of that level of postmodern thinking where everything's Everything's okay, and you just have to accept everything. I, I don't necessarily agree with that. And I, of course, I'm strong manning a little here. Um, yet, yeah, walking that line can be really difficult. But where it seems to really be the most effective, like I said, is when um, things arise from within communities. Um, and one example, I guess, to close out uh, of that would be there's a woman, and I forget her name, but she was featured all over. Um, including on Oprah, I think, um, which is how I found out about her. But she is a an activist in Sub-Saharan Africa, and she speaks out against female genital mutilation. But she grew up within this community, and so she understands how they think and how they feel, what arguments would work. And she, without any sort of Western influence or funding, um, she just drives around and goes to different villages and talks. And she has been quite effective in reducing the rate of female genital mutilation. She's been quite good at what she does. So examples like that are sort of, I think, the most effective way to get people to do things. And now she does have Western support and help. I think um, like people bought her a 
hard. Um, but instead of saying, all right, now we're going to take over, we're going to send a bunch of white people to tell them what to do, it's not, it's not going to work. But she has done so much work just on her own doing that. And you see examples like that all over the world. So that seems to be really the most effective way to bring about um, a true and lasting change. So we have any, maybe we have room for one short question. We're going to wrap up. Is there any last questions? All right. All right. Thank you so much, Ina. You're welcome. Good. Um, we're going to have some fun events coming up soon, so 